is here, no? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for having me here. Um, yes, maybe I should be a bit more precise about my profession because I'm a book and paper conservator. And um, when I joined the TIB, um, it was my task to design a preservation concept for the uh, analog book collection. And um, yes, and while I was um, going through the inventory, I came across uh, the films of the Institute of Scientific Film. And I thought we have to do something about these, these films because um, you could actually smell the problem. So, so that's, that's why I'm here now today as a book and paper conservator. So, so off we go. Um, yes, Delft uh, has nothing to do with the city in Holland, but is the acronym of uh, digitizing ethnological film stock. And um, yes, I do not want to focus my talk uh, so much today on the technical aspects of digitization. I would rather like um, concentrate on what's important to us in the project and our experiences so far. Um, of course, I will also present uh, the, the process and its most important aspects to you. Um, the project started in uh, October 2017 and will run until um, September next year, so we are just halfway through. Yes, and um, before I present uh, the actual di digitization process, I would like to introduce the um, film collection to you. Yes, um, the Institute for Scientific Film, IWF for short, um, was founded in Göttingen in 1956, and its uh, predecessors date back to the 1920s. Um, the Institute's task was to produce and distribute scientific films. Um, the film collection comprises approximately 11,500 uh, 11, titles, and uh, this makes the Institute's uh, film collection one of the world's largest in, yeah, in, the, in the world, yes. Um, However, the number of titles says little about the um, uh, natural number of physical copies which we have in our storage facilities. Um, there are multiple copies of many films, uh, plus films for distribution, like videos and DVD formats, and audio tapes in different language versions. It is um, therefore difficult to establish a really precise number, but we estimate that there are about 33,000 films in our storage facilities, which occupy a total of 2,000 shelf meters. A very special collection of the Institute of Scientific Film was the Encyclopedia Cinematographica, to which uh, the films of this project belong. Um, the Encyclopedia was founded in 1952 by the former director of the IWF, Gotthard Wolf, as a kind of film library. Um, the idea behind the films was the systematic study of behavior, natural phenomena, rituals and practices, and movements in animals, um, plants, substances, and finally also in humans. The films are relatively short, um, from yeah, on average about 10 to 20 minutes, and um, the intention was to facilitate comparative research, and the films in its entirety should form an encyclopedia. A film publication always uh, consists of the film itself together with an accompanying booklet. And this booklet contained information about the content of the film, technical data on the of the film, and references to further literature. The oldest films are about 100 years old, and the majority of them were made between the late 1950s until the end of the 1980s. The age of the films, however, um, refers to the content. Most of the copies were made after 1950, so there are no nitrate film in this collection. Um, the films were made according to strict rules. The founder, Gotthard Wolf himself, stipulated that the films intended to be part of the encyclopedia should be strictly scientific and highly realistic. So um, I'm going to slightly undermine the strict scientific intentions by showing you stills uh, of one of my favorite films so far, The Roof Tile Maker of Frauenberg at Work. Um, in this film, one sees not only the production of roof tiles, um, but also the life of a man in his surroundings. So sometimes the boundaries between uh, strict science and, um, and um, a human portrait get a bit blurred. Yes. Um, in the project, uh, we have mainly um, 60 millimeter films in black and white in color. We have silent films, films with optical tracks and separate ma magnetic sounds. Uh, furthermore, we have digital beta cams. Um, of course, a film 
doesn't only consist of the of its of the physical copy itself. Often there are a number of other documents um, documents which records, for example, the production and distribution of the films. These documents also exist for the ethnological film collection. These include photos and slides of the expeditions, asynchronous sound recordings, and of course the accompanying booklets published published with each film. Yes, our goal is the digitization of 2,000 titles, corresponding to about 500 hours of film over a period uh, of two years, indexing the films through descriptive metadata, and making the films available via TIB's portal for audiovisual media. Um, before that, the legal situation must be clarified for each film. Also, a number of films um, can't be made freely avail available um, due to privacy laws, and uh, others depicting rituals would be against the ethics of science. Um, yes, the film uh, receive a digital object identifier, so the films can be permanently found and cited, unlike films found on YouTube or Vimeo, for example. And um, yeah, last but not least, um, digital preservation. Yes, and now I'd like to give you a brief insight into the uh, digitizing process. Um, first step, the selection of the film copy, then choosing the target format, the actual digitizing process, quality control, and then digital preservation. Yes, in the project, um, we have for most of the films one 60 millimeter archive copy and two 60 millimeter distribution copies for each film title. This makes a total of uh, 6,000 films copies for approximately 2,000 titles. Um, we use the RTI Pulsar to inspect the 60 millimeter film material. This is a film tester, um, a slightly older device. Um, which can uh, detect mechanical damage such as defective splices and perforation damage. We also collect data on the state of preservation of the copy. Due to the large number of films and the limited time available, this is unfortunately only possible to a very limited extent, which is why, why we have limited ourselves to the most important information. First, we record all the information of the film can, the exact copy name and the film copying lab with the date the copy was made then mechanical damage, the number of perforation damage and defective splices and scratches, which uh, influenced the image quality. Um, in the project, I tested uh, around 1,000 films for vinegar syndrome, and um, 200 of these films have either reached a critical point or have a serious vinegar problem. This, the result is also documented with the date. Um, the shrinkage values are measured during digitization by the scanner. We document the minimum, maximum, and the average value with the date. And um, color fading is graded from small, medium, strong, and we document in which direction the color fade goes, um, from red to blue to whatever. Um, the collected data is then archived together with the digital archival master. The idea behind this was to connect the analog object as a source with a digital object. object. Yes. Now, um, this is something for techies. Um, I won't go deeper into this matter. Um, just let, let me say that uh, we digitized uh, the films in 2K. And uh, when defining the format, it was important to us uh, that they were standardized, openly documented, widely used, and suitable for long-term preservation. Um, in doing so, we followed the best practice guidelines for, uh, from FACI and the Swiss Memoria. And yes, and as a conservator responsible for Delft, I work um, closely together with our digital preservation team, and um, you met Merle this uh, morning, and my yeah my dear colleague Merle and um, uh, Mickey Lindler, uh, our technical analyst. Uh, she is uh, attending remotely. Um, yes, um, she also helps me very much a lot, and uh, yes, they'll they'll be really happy to to answer questions. And uh, yes, I'm happy if I don't have to <laughs> in this respect. <laughs> Yes, and um, here are the requirements uh, for the digital beta come, and I'll come back to this later. Yes, an uh, important re requirement for our service provider was the careful handling of the films during the scanning process. Um, we use the scanner MWA spinner. On the left picture, you can see how the film is trans transported to the scanner. Um, the films don't have to be prepared for, th for the scanning process. Um, which uh, offers the advantage that films with fragile splices and perforation damage, damage can be scanned without any problems. Um, one special feature of the scanner is that we can adjust the tension on the film. In the picture on the right, um, you can see a, a warped film. The color films in particular tend to twist quite a lot in the scanner, which can lead to problems with, with uh, focusing. 
For a stable film transport, the tension can be adjusted to the amount of warping. And currently, we scanned about uh, 100 hours of film, and so far, not a single film has been torn. Yes, we, we do not use wet gate. Um, the scratches are reduced by the scanner's diffuse light source. Yes, and then comes uh, quality control. Um, we get seven hours of film per week uh, from our service provider. In uh, other words, two terabytes on a SSD hard drive. And um, yes, why the hard drive? Because uh, our service provider is uh, located in a village with a bad network connection. Um, the delivery includes the archival master in every one. Um, we only use the Matroshka container as an archive file and not the DBX to save storage space. Uh, then the der derivative copy, checksums, and uh, technical metadata. Yes, each delivery is checked uh, for the follow. No, oh. sorry. Yeah, each um, uh, delivery is checked for the following parameters. Um, firstly, the correct file name, which consists of the identifier used for the object in our media asset management, and the signature of the IWF. Um, then we check the, whether the content is complete. Does the film title match the content, and is the running uh, time of the film correct? Um, the digital image is checked for possi possible image errors produced during the scanning process, and this is a, this is a real-time process that takes up the same amount of time as the running time of the film. Yes, um, to test whether the migration from DPX to FV1 was really lossless, the DPX generates checksums per frame. Frame and V5 are also generated by the FV1. Um, these two checksums are compared, and if there are any deviations in the um, checksums, we know the migration was not lossless. Um, during preparation for ingest into the digital archive, the storage uh, structure is checked, te technical metadata is extracted, and the checksums embedded in the FFV1 are checked for each slice. And um, to ensure that the digitization service adhere to our specifications, we've written a media conch policy, which allows us to automatically check the master files for technically, technically correct file format production. And um, at the end, the master is played for testing purposes and to ensure that the, that the FFV1 is also play playable. Um, yes, so far we've checked about, around uh, 550 films and um, we haven't found any technical errors yet which doesn't mean that there are errors, but uh, we didn't find uh, any. <laughs> yes. Um, this is how we um, structure our films in the um, digital archive. We store our films in collections. Um, every collection is given a project number. We have adopted this project number from the IWF. Every project is given a number there. Uh, the number of films contained in each project can differ greatly. There are projects with only um, a few films and projects with up to 70 films and more. Uh, the project number encompasses all these films. In the first box, uh, you see the preservation master, the descriptive metadata, the technical metadata, and the conservation metadata of the analog film copy. This is um, the connection between the analog and the digital object. And uh, additionally, we archive another derivative copy with the codec H265, and um, we won't provide this derivative right now because uh, you cannot open this codec with every browser. In the second box, you find the access copy for our media asset management, the MP4 with the additional booklet, um, descriptive metadata, and the download versions. Um, the connection, as um, pointed out but, um, by the red arrow, between the two are the descriptive uh, metadata because um, they are identical. Um, yes, and the last box uh, consists of the additional material, for example, the pro project files and the photos taken, uh, taken uh, during the projects. Um, this material is relevant for all films um, created within the framework of this project. Uh, yes, and um, yes, and then follows the next collection with a new project number, and um, this is an ongoing process. Yes, so much for the process, yes. Um, every project is also a learning process. And now I would like to show you with an example of what we have learned so far, what is important to us, and how we define quality in this project. Um, we also have some digital beta cams in the project that we want to digitize again. Um, for this, I tried to find out information about the process in which the digital beta cams were, ma were made. Unfortunately, the existing data sheets are not very informative. Um, some questions remained unanswer unanswered. For example, 
Uh, we know that the source material for the Digital Beta comes was 60 millimeter film. We don't know which copy exactly was digitized, and unfortunately, we don't have 60 millimeter film for most of the Digital Beta comes anymore. With that, facts were created. We know that the films were digitized in SD and HD, but we don't know exactly which film was scanned in which quality. And some of the films were extensively um, image processed, for example, um, retouched and color corrected. But we don't know exactly what was done, and it was not documented. So in, in other words, um, the digitization of the film took place 20 years ago, and we already have to deal with the loss of information on different levels. So, so how we, do we define quality in this project? Um, we define quality according to five points. Uh, firstly, sustainability in the choice of digitization parameters. Uh, we could say that the selected target formats and resolution only ever reflect the current state of technology. The choice of format determines future access to the digital objects. Therefore, the format should be standardized, widely um, used, and openly documented. Uh, when choosing the resolution, one should not only consider the follow-up costs for the digital preservation and storage, but also the state of preservation of the films, because the state of preservation of the film copy influences the quality of the digitized object. Um, secondly, standardized um, co collecting of standardized metadata. Um, the entire uh, transformation process from analog to digital should be documented. This includes the documentation of the state of preservation of the analog film copy, the actual scanning process, and the quality control with checksums and, and so on. Yes. Um, Another aspect that we have to keep in mind is the documentation of the source material. A film work consists of the sum of its surviving film copies. So we do not digitize the film, but only one manifestation of the film. And as an institution, we are obliged to state which manifestation we have digitized. Yes, and we also want to make sure that the originals are well preserved as a reference, as a source for a new scan or for issues that are not yet foreseeable. And the last aspect we find important is retaining the authenticity of the original material. Um, here you can see film stills from two of our ethnological films. The pictures on the left side are from digital images uh, taken in 2007 at the Institute for Scientific Film, and the pictures on the right side are all new scans uh, from the project. The results can be quite different. Um, there are two aspects um, I would like to focus on. Firstly, overscan. Overscan was not possible for technical reasons at that time. But if you take a closer look at the pictures, you can see that some of the image information has been lost. In the project, we decided to scan the films with Overscan and make them available to our users like this. Um, of course, you have to say that these are not motion picture films, but scientific films. Especially for films like this, an authentic presentation is very important. And that's exactly why we have to de deliver the whole picture information. The question of how we make the films available to our users with or without Overscan led us to discussions. It was primarily a question of changing viewing habits. Of course, uh, a picture looks tidier or calmer without Overscan, like framing a picture with a passepartout. But you have to be aware that you are destroying the original composition of the picture and thus violating the in integrity of the film work. Um, one example. The digitization of text is common practice in libraries, and it is completely natural to trans transfer the complete book page. It would be absurd to cut a text because it is technically impossible to, to do it otherwise. And with, pi with pictures, it is done. Uh, secondly, post-processing to improve the image quality, uh, for example, retouching. Um, yes, I, I'm not sure if you can see this on the pictures, but the films were um, modified at the IWF. And we have decided to leave the material as it is, even in the case of severe discoloration, because we don't know what the colors looked like originally. Um, yes, here you can see an example. Um, the question of whether we, can, we can't improve the colors a little has also led to discussions in our institution. And here, too, it's, um, it's, about, um, about, it's about changing viewing habits. You run the risk of removing original artifacts that are part of the film's historical production process during post-processing. But um, the question of uh, restoration is always an individual decision that has to be answered from project to project. Um, yes, as I have mentioned before, we have for each film title three copies, one archival and two distribution copies. 
Unfortunately, we don't have any original camera, ne camera negatives or interpositives for our film collection, which means that the archive and distribution copies are our originals, so to speak. We cannot say with certainty to what extent the existing film copy has moved away from the original ne negative and thus determine the loss of quality. Especially films made before 1950 are copied films because we do not have any nitro film material in our collection. However, we can say with certainty that these are authorized versions in terms of content. When planning the project, it was of course assumed that the archive copies were in good condition. The term archive copy suggests an intactness that has proved to be inaccurate in the course of the project. So far we have viewed uh, about 800 films and in only, in only about two thirds of them we were able to use the archive copy. It is therefore important when planning a project to have enough time to study the material and to make sure to have enough time for selecting the best copy available. Yes, and uh, a special feature in this project are the editorial and production files of the IWF. These files contain, for example, the correspondence regarding the planning of the projects, as well as the film title lists or correspondence with the film copying labs. These files are an important part of the Institute's history and give, give a deep insight into the context in which the films were made. On the one hand, they give an idea of how much heart and soul was put into each individual film, and on the other hand, they contribute to a deeper understanding of the film content. It was important to us to expand the concept of film by understanding the film not only as a physical copy, but as a sum of its available copies and the additional material, in our case, the project files. This is why we decided in the Delft project to digitize these documents as well. How and whether we can make this material available, we don't yet know. So, yes, and that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. And so we are back on schedule, and there's questions, and we can answer them. Perfect. Well, well I, I, I have questions. I mean, you when it's question time, I have questions. <laughs> um, um, da, 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 da. <laughs> where, where is it? It's, it's, it's uh, about digital beta cam. Yes, we are just in the process of defining the requirements, and we have still some open questions. And firstly, concerning, concerning the time code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the time code should not appear in the image, and um, yes, but we of course we do want to save it, and and at this this stage we don't yet know how to save the time code into the matroshka. Yeah, this is one question, and um, I've got a second one. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, and um, in in order to create the derivative from the master, the master must be deinterlaced, and um, there. Are different ways of doing this, I assume. And um, we don't know what will happen during this process and whether artifacts will be produced. And also, this is a very time-consuming process, I think. So. <laughs> I'm sure some other people will have um, picked up on that. If all of the sources were progressive film originally, they will never need deinterlacing. Mm. If they're on DigiBeta as an interlaced, it's actually PSF, it's not really interlaced. So you won't need to consider deinterlacing. In fact, deinterlacing will soften the image and make the picture look worse. Okay, okay. Uh, Merle, Merle, D did you listen? <laughs> <laughs> you can catch me in the break. And as the time code, probably the safest thing is capture it as an analog audio track for now. Okay. Um, because you can always do things with it later on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. Do you have a question or an answer? No, it's, uh, it's just I, I think with that, I think that, that would generally be true unless it was, if it was 16 or 18 FPS, you might get some issues with where it was conforming to 25. Like I, I yeah, so if your sources were, yeah, if it was run through at 25 FPS, if it was PAL, you're fine, but you actually could get some significant issues if it was 16 or 18 FPS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. We have an online question. We have a final question. And this is going to be our last. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, what software are they using to digitize or ingest their digital beta cam tapes? <laughs> <laughs> Do 
you mean the, the, the software for, for, for the scanning process? The software the scanner is using? <laughs> Yeah, there's like a eight second delay or something. Yeah, we'll get back to it. Yeah, I'm sorry. So it's an incredibly um, challenging project and it's a really fantastic collection. Mm -hmm. And could you please give us some ideas how people can, how do you imagine giving access to this work? Collection, yeah. No, the giving access. So. You, you somehow your 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 process is stopped at the digital digitizing, mm. and there, I, I as far as I understand, um, or I think this is quite normal, mm. that all all the processes in digitization somehow end up and uh, shoot at, or we are looking at giving access. So how do you think? How do you imagine um, that people can get access, can approach, can get access to this, watch these films? Besides going to your institution, yes, we we have a, a audio visual portal, and there you can see the films. But uh, the problem with these films is that um, um, you can't um, because, as I said, because of the ethics of science, you you have to be. Um, you, 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 we cannot show these films freely. You know, not every everybody can see it. You know, and so you have to. Um, you have to be a scientist, or, or have to um, have to have some some, some I don't know. A researcher, maybe? Yeah, you, you have, have to have a research interest, and then you can watch the films. And um, this is one thing. And um, yes, yes, that's basically. So um, we're not quite sure how we can make this film uh, uh, films available right now at this, at this moment.